Right. So welcome uh, to 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 the second day uh, of the Viral Masculinities Conference. Uh, the second, uh, the first, well, the first panel, um, the Manosphere. Uh, this follows after yesterday's opening um, keynote by by John Mercer, which touched upon quite a few uh, of the topics that we'll we'll try to cover. Uh, uh, in the next, you know, between now and, and the 11th of September. Um, today we will, uh, it's the first of two panels on the Manosphere. The other one is, I now cannot remember, but in, in a few days. Um, and we we have uh, Daniel uh, and Kaufer, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just... Can't, can't do it. Uh, we had we were supposed to have a uh, great uh, Yasser as well, uh, who cannot make it due to health reasons. Then we have uh, Henry Price and and uh, Jacob Johansson. Uh, Johansson. Uh, we will start with with uh, Daniel, and I will <coughs> if you give me a second re uh, introduce them. Uh, Stop sharing this. Okay. So, Daniel uh, is giving a, a talk. So, so, the first talk on um, uh, titled Gendering Reddit Men Drink Beer, Women Drink Cosmos. Um, Daniel is a PhD student in creative writing at the University of Utah uh, with an MFA from Notre Dame, where they were a 2019 Sparts Fellow. Uh, disabled uh, by sexual from North Mississippi, their work has appeared uh, in the Chicago Quarterly Review, Teen House Online, the Carolina Quarterly Pen Review and others. Uh, so the title, uh, like I said at the start, Gendering Reddit, Men Drink Beer, Women Drink Cosmos. Uh, we will take the each, I will introduce each speaker as, as we go and we'll take Q, uh, Q and A questions at the end. Um, if, uh, please, all of you watching, if you want to use the chat room to, you know, talk, amongst yourselves, feel, feel free to do so. Uh, there's, there is also a, a hashtag viral masculinities if you're on, on, on Twitter. Uh, and at the end, for any questions, either write them on the chat and I uh, read them out loud for you, for, for everybody. Uh, otherwise, just signal that you'd like to, to ask a question and I will uh, unmute you and, and hand over the, the mic to you as it were. So Daniel, uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us and, and uh, over to you. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, hi everybody, this is terrific. I wanna thank everybody for attending. I think the numbers in this room surpass any real room I've ever given a write a paper <laughs> in or give a presentation in. I wanna thank our incredibly hardworking host and organizer, uh, Dr. Flencio. This has been a very wonderful opportunity to work on something a little bit new for me. As was mentioned, I'm a creative writing is more my background, but I have been I'm doing some, some theory in academia, and this one kind of falls a little bit in between. I've tried to make this a short paper, um, and in that sense, it is more designed around identifying and questioning certain issues um, than maybe answering for them, as is often the case. Um, this material is largely centered around my own confusion and surprise as a long-term user of Reddit, which is not something that I would otherwise um, like to admit. Um, I hope that, at the very least, um, these few quick words here can add to the conversations I anticipate having with the rest of this conference. So I will now share my screen. <clears throat> so on the left, I have, you know, three or four <clears throat> figures that will come up um, that I figured it would give you all something to maybe parse and stare at while I'm reading. But on the right, I just have my actual 
paper, so y'all are free to read along too. And you'll see on the left here, um, these these are pulled from Reddit. These are called sidebars. It's like the information that a given subreddit shares with with its community. Um, it's kind of the splash page, the first thing you see other than the actual content. So on the left, it's the hold my beer sidebar. And on the right, it's the hold my Cosmo sidebar. You'll see there are some slight differences that maybe you can start parsing on your own. So <clears throat> right, I have something cut in my throat, of course, but trying to clear it. Digital feminist scholarship has undergone significant work on untangling the so-called manosphere, this confederacy of men's rights subreddits where women are unwelcome on the sixth most popular website, Reddit. I had thought that Reddit was the sixth most popular in the world, but that does not appear to be the case. It does appear to be the sixth most popular in Reddit. Of course, in the US, of course, those statistics do fluctuate fairly regularly. The stakes for the manosphere have risen um, as the consequences have moved offline. We know, of course, that the Isla Vista shooter, Elliot Roger, was a prolific Redditor and member of the manosphere communities like Pickup Artist Hate and Forever Alone. The Southern Poverty Law Center points to the red pill, which has since been quarantined or effectively closed to new traffic since 2019. That's what, this, that's what you see here if you try to visit the red pill as a new user. And in fact, you, you have to have a verified email address to do so. These subreddits order the world according to gender in an exclusionary and unempirical way, but they're not really unique in doing so. Though the content of subreddits like the Red Pillar Forever Alone may be more radicalized. Um, in terms of organization and logic, they are part of a, a larger network that replicates itself across the entire platform. Um, we'll see that cool things are called porn, friendly things are called bros, <clears throat> and only men drink beer, even when women are also drinking beer. In other words, the manosphere isn't really a small part of Reddit. The entirety of Reddit, from the Red Pill to Hold My Cosmo, is simply a small part of the manosphere. A Redditor named B. Berkey pulled CSS data on user-generated flares from gender self-identifying subreddits, Ask Men, Ask Women, Tall and Short, which means that on those subreddits, users tag themselves with their genders, so it was easy to kind of pull that data. And they analyzed male-female ratios across a variety of popular subreddits. Relying on the same basic male-female binary that characterizes much of these estimates and is not, of course, inherently accurate, they found that Reddit averaged 69.8% male and 30.2% female, which matches other estimates of about 70-30, and also represents an inversion of Instagram's demographics, which are about 70% female and 30% male. Again, in kind of a simplified binary. Men make up the vast majority of users on virtually every subreddit except a very small handful that includes LGBT, Harry Potter, Gone Wild, which is a user submitted pornography site, Troll X Chromosomes, Makeup Addiction, Momit, and Reddit Lacaristas. And those are, you'll see at the bottom of this chart, but we'll start at the, at the top here. And you can see some of the kinds of uh, subreddits that are very much, I don't want to use word, the, the word dominated seems loaded, but male dominated subreddits. A masculine default of gender essentialism kind of ensues across all of Reddit from these grounds. Um, popular subreddit teenagers quickly had to spin off fee majors, which is a very awkward construction, to provide a space free of sex jokes and male harassment for um, women users. Streetwear spun off women's streetwear because of the former's gender homogeneity. And Hold My Beer, one of the most popular subreddits, spun off Hold My Cosmo, which is now even more popular than Hold My Beer. Other entire subreddits have been designed around deploying gender as the button of a joke, such as one called UNBHBBIIVCHIDCTIICBG, or upvoted not because girl, but because it is very cool. However, I do concede that I initially clicked because girl. Then there's the so-called Safe for Work Porn Network, which refers to the unique nomenclature of a cluster of photography appreciation communities like food porn, earth porn, human porn, and military porn, um, through which everything that is potentially non-gendered is now reprocessed as pornography. It might go without saying that not only is this not the way content needs to be organized, um, especially in the case of this paper, Hold My Beer, um, the concept of handing off a beer before performing an exceptional stunt under the influence of said drink is not something that is inherently gendered. 
but it's actually, as we'll see with some of the actual content, one of the least empirical ways to do so. For example, do women drink beer? Naturally, the answer is yes. Um, move this down a little bit for us. We'll see, a, see where you start to get a little bit more heterogeneity in the gender distributions. But I'll actually, here, this is see. In fact, although the general population of craft beer drinkers in the US follows the same distribution as Reddit, about 70% male, 30% female, in major markets like Portland and Massachusetts, female drinkers outnumber male drinkers. And in almost all cases, women are understood to spend more on beer than men do at breweries in particular, which is just some of the data that's out there. But you wouldn't know any of that from Reddit. As the about section reads in Hold My Beer sidebar, hey man, hold my beer, check this out. The classic words that end in either awesomeness or injury. If the title didn't suggest that we were dealing with men, the language certainly does. The subject of all 10 of the top time posts on Hold My Beer, and I invite y'all to pull up your own browsers and scan it right now, are men. But women are frequently present. In fact, women are frequently the ones drinking the beer. The top visible post of all time, hold my beer while I challenge this woman to a skull, in which a skull is like a like the shotgun, you know, try to finish in one, one drink, um, shows a woman and a man racing to finish their beers. The woman actually finishes first and the man simply passes out and falls over. Where the gender is not specified by the title, there's really no way to know that the man is even the subject of this post. But the community takes the gendered assumptions of the post and capitalizes on them sexually and quite aggressively. The top comment reads, this clip had like four different climaxes, to which someone replies, I know I had at least one. And someone else, that's four more than I've ever given my wife. Another top comment, that's a dangerous woman right there, which registers some agreement. Never chug race against anyone that can deep throw. Another one of the top 10 posts, hold my beer while I siphon the pitcher, shows a woman holding a pitcher full of beer and her own glass full of beer, while a man sneaks up behind her with a straw and tries to steal her drink. It is again, literally the woman who is holding all of the beers here, but the eye of the post remains the man. The comments are not as sexualized, but they're rather charmed by the assumed inadequacy of the woman. Why is she holding a pitcher, someone asks, with most people responding because she likes warm beer, which is of course something that um, beer drinkers are not understood to like. In the manosphere, the appearance of a woman holding a beer not only beggars disbelief, or beggar's belief, but must be explained by inadequacy or bad taste on her part. It's only when you get down to about the top, the 12th top post of all time, hold my beer while I do the splits and down this bottle by famous power user Gallo Boob, does the subject become a woman. Fully clothed, she performs a split while finishing a bottle of vodka. Virtually all of the comments are sexually interested in the content ranging from penetrating her with the bottle to criticizing her Halloween costume to marriage material. But at least it's acknowledged that women can consume alcohol and even like men perform interesting actions while doing so. At some point, the manosphere must have realized this too because then they created Hold My Cosmo to keep their gender roles straight. The two subreddits don't appear to have the same creators or really even the same moderator team, but the top posters significantly overlap and both have about the same reach. Hold My Beer was created in 2012 and today has about 1.2 million members. Hold My Cosmo was created a year and a half later and today nearly beats out Hold My Beer with 1.3 million members. And the top posts on Hold My Cosmo do significantly better than the top posts on Hold My Beer in terms of upvotes. Just... Sorry, so sorry. But these are not just the same subreddits divided along a theoretically clean gender distinction. The thesis of each subreddit is inherently evaluative and they evaluate their subjects quite differently as well. Where the events portrayed by drunk men, in theory at least, as we've seen many of them are women, are generally understood to be impressive on some level to elevate their subjects through their uninhibited inebriation, Hold My Cosmo is looking for a cheaper laugh. Subtitled, Hey Bitch, Hold My Cosmo, the sidebar this time reads, girls failing at life in funny ways, usually drunk. These are girls, not women, which may be a trend we have noticed before on this website. 
um, despite everyone involved knowing, they have to be at least 21 years old in the U.S. to consume a Cosmo. So there's really no reason to ever use the term girls here unless you're being deliberately diminutive. And while men are engaged in awesomeness, per their sidebar, girls are simply failing, and that's funny. The top post here, also by power user Galoboob, is titled, Hold My Cosmo While I Show My Parents What Four Years of College Education Amounted To. The content itself is modest, neither awesome nor failing. A woman in a graduation cap drinks a beer um, and then jumps into a river. <clears throat> Not only is the woman literally just simply drinking a beer, um, which is just from the wrong subreddit, she appears to be doing something quite routine, as the comments are quick to point out. This is Texas State University. It's tradition to jump in that river through and run, they run through campus after graduation. The river is spring fed and it's cold AF, even if it's 110 degrees outside. Indeed, most of the commenters are uninclined to bite. What's up with all the hate in here? Chick just graduated and she can't celebrate her own way? Chick. But if you scroll far enough, you return to the standard reports of sexualization achieved without provocation. I need to find her and marry her. Wife material, talent, and a degree would smash with the power of a thousand supernovas. She seems fun, would wife, 10 out of 10. I'm aroused. And a bunch of references to subreddits like cringe and trashy, which I haven't mentioned before, but that's kind of how Redditors attempt to insult each other. They reference um, categorical subreddits that they think that person would belong to. Both of those subreddits host content submitted by the same power user, Galobu, a 30-something Greek Lebanese ex-landscape architect named Robert Alum. A photo of his parents at a beach on the day of his conception, here we go, um, it was kind of one of his big first viral hits in a subreddit called Old School Cool. And, you know, within like 15 months or something, he was chatting uh, with, online at least, uh, on, on Zoom basically, with Alexis Ohanian, one of Reddit superstar founders. Ohanian advised Alan to parlay his millions of karma, which is kind of Reddit's point system, um, how it organizes content, into something bigger. And soon the British media firm Unilad hired Alan as a social media executive. Galibu definitely is part of a special group because of his eye for what people will like, Forbes quoted Ohanian as saying. Reddit is well known for being the launch point for viral content online. And it's because of Redditors like him who have such great taste when it comes to finding and predicting what will be popular. Which of course raises the question, is great taste really what explains these aggressively gendered organizational logics we're seeing? Does taste really determine what goes where and why? Uh, who is marriage material? Who is trashy? Who is cringy? Are the suits at Unilad uh, the product of the lad bible group which claims to be redefining what lads are really the best of the tastemakers as any redditor knows i'm sure there are many amongst us redditors pride themselves on their relative appreciation for logic and reason especially compared to other women dominated platforms like instagram or even twitter without an appeal to something stronger an ideological lens of misogyny for example it makes it tough to explain their attachment to these empirically untrue gender conventions. Women are holding and drinking beer in the top posts of both subreddits, yet one of them is introduced with the words, hey man, and the other with, hey bitch. This isn't an empirical worldview. This is the aggressively gendered misogyny of the manosphere, and it manifests itself across subreddits regardless of the actual content. What does that mean for the individual Redditor who has to consume this material? When a subreddit itself, like cringe or trashy, is shorthand for an insult, when the category collapses into the actual person, what happens to men who drink Cosmo or women who drink beer? Are they simply excluded or do they not exist as people in this organizational structure at all? It's not enough to reject the radical subreddits like the red pill or forever alone. As long as Reddit itself organizes the world into beer drinkers and Cosmo drinkers, it will forever be toxic. The platform recreates the patriarch and the patriarch is easily aroused and deeply misogynistic. And at least with men, the patriarch is a viral content genius, which means I don't know how you, how you fight them, <laughs> except with better viral content in the other direction. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. I hope that wasn't too long. Um, and I will turn it back over now to Dr. Florencia. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Daniel. That that was um, really interesting, and especially for me, who uh, I have I don't think I've read it much, much a lot of time. Um, it's really interesting to 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 hear from you on 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 how um, it's kind of gendered dimensions. Um, it's actually, and this may be something we we want to to talk afterwards during Q and A. Also reminds me of something that. Mercer was saying yesterday around around the condensation these are being um, condensed in, in online environments um, and the kind of the problems associated uh, with that uh, so we will move to, to one second where is this oh it's Henry Henry Price uh, from the, the, the University of, of, of Birmingham in, in the UK. One second as I pull out your bio. Is a fourth year a PhD student in political science at the University of Birmingham uh, and I believe also a, a a graduate teaching assistant uh, there. Uh, that is, if Birmingham are still honoring graduate teaching assistant, <laughs> and not too busy political right now. Um, and um, so, so he, um, Henry's thesis examines the entanglement of neoliberalism and anti-feminism anti using a popular incel forum as a case study. Uh, Henry has taught on, on, on several undergraduate mo modules and published on a variety of uh, feminist and political science blogs. Um, and from, from what I get, um, his uh, research is really interesting, particularly in, in how, uh, I guess, um, a lot of, 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 of discourse has been produced on the relationship relationship between contemporary feminism and neoliberalism and I think this kind of angle of looking at neoliberalism in relation to, to contemporary um, incel and kind of alt-right uh, masculinities is kind of quite quite interesting so I hand over oh, uh, the talk lay down and rot the entanglement of neoliberalism and incel uh, over to you Henry okay, okay thanks for that uh very kind introduction and for organizing such a cool um, uh, platform for these kinds of discussions to occur. Um, really excited to um, talk to you guys today um, about uh, some of the research that I've been doing. Um, as Zhao uh, said, my thesis um, uh, examines the way in which in cell, uh, which is a case study in kind of contemporary forms of anti-feminism, might be productively understood or more productively understood um, as a phenomenon that's born out of an ideological environment. Um, today, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about one part of my thesis. Uh, while I've attempted to minimize reference to the most violent material in my data, this presentation does kind of come with a uh, content war, the themes at least of suicide and misogyny and sexual violence. Um, okay, so for those of you who are blissfully unfamiliar, uh, INCEL, which stands for Involuntary Celibate, is one community within the Manosphere, um, a mostly online network of loosely affiliated groups which share concerns about the welfare of men and boys who it is claimed confront a society which demeans and disempowers them on the basis of their gender. Uh, of all the Manosphere groups, which, you know, includes pickup artists and men going their own way, Incel is perhaps the most ridiculed, most derided, and the most pathologized. Um, it is, we are told, a community built upon the aggrieved entitlement and misogyny of basement-dwelling, unwashed, and hateful young men. This is not necessarily an inaccurate depiction, evidenced by the regularity with which threads on its major forum, incels.co, devolve into retributive and violent sexual fantasy. And the no notorious spree killings committed in California in 2014 and Toronto in 2018. 
in both cases, the perpetrator justified their actions by referring to the injustice that they had faced in the form of sexless and romanceless lives. Both the perpetrators are also subject to supposedly veneration in incels.co and elsewhere, as are other misogynist killers like Mark Lapine. So angry, entitled misogynist and so on, Perhaps this isn't inaccurate, but also perhaps it's not the whole story. Um, what I want to propose briefly to you today is that incel is not, as some journalistic and academic accounts would have it, an outlier or an aberrant phenomenon. Incel was obviously not formed in a vacuum, and sexlessness itself is a tale as old as time. Indeed, there is a history of communities bounded by difficulties in dating, which do not, for instance, endorse the idea that all women, by virtue of their gender, live life on easy mode. Something about the present moment, then, seems to have directly or indirectly facilitated a particularly traumatic and vengeful response. My claim is that when examined in its ideological context, incel is in many interesting and significant aspects reflective of a complex entanglement between the sexual anxiety of young men moral ideas about human capital, meritocracy, and competition, and a culture war framing known within the community as the Black Pill, which provides profoundly anti-feminist and misogynist explanation for the incel plight. Much like the diagnosis offered by the better known Red Pill philosophy, the institutionalization and heightened visibility of feminist ideas and language across political, cultural, and legal sites is presented as both absolute and responsible for the systemic disempowerment of all men, other than those in the top 20% of a physical uh, a hierarchy of physical attractiveness. Uh, to acquaint myself with incel, uh, which like most other fairly online subcultures relies heavily on a vocabulary and knowledge suffused with internal references, I have been immersing myself in the subculture and within the community for nearly two years, which has been a lot of fun. Um, this adapts the approach that was taken by Rachel O'Neill in her pioneering work in the pig artist or seduction community in London. O'Neill's central claim, which my project is attempting to develop, is that, and I quote, the orientating logics and underpinning premises of this community industry are in many ways consonant with broader reconfigurations of intimacy and sexuality taking place in and beyond the contemporary British context. In the case of incel, the logic, uh, logics and underpinning premise of the community and its worldview simultaneously inhabit and reproduce, but also oppose and critique this broader reconfiguration. A reconfiguration that we shouldn't forget has already been expertly critiqued as decidedly ambiguous in its effects on contemporary gender relations by feminist theorists like Rosalind Gill and Angela McRobbie, amongst many, many others. This dynamic of profoundly investing in a neoliberal ethos while rallying against it is most pronounced, I claim, in the way that incel self-identifies as a subjectivity of failed sexual competitor. Put differently then, the belief in market outcomes as an objective measure of value and the competitive nature of all social behavior is both cause and effect of the incel worldview. Though it is young, there is a growing academic literature on incel, uh, most notably coming from counter-extremism and security studies. The US Department of Homeland Security recently awarded a $250,000 grant to Georgia State University to research incel as an emerging male supremacist movement. John Horgan, who's leading this research, stated that he sees, and I quote, incel violence against women as nothing less than a new form of terrorism. I don't disagree with this assessment, nor do I think it's entirely hyperbolic to approach the study of incel in this way. However, I do strongly believe that sociological and cultural analyses can aid and assist in this kind of secure focused work by restoring complexity to what can quite easily and understandably be considered a simple narrative of embittered, entitled and retributive masculinity. 
I say this because for sure the incel community is in some ways surprisingly diverse. Though reliable demographic data is hard to find, that which does exist indicates a multi-ethnic community which is possibly reflected in the fierce debates held between incels over the importance of social construction in racialized beauty standards. I also quickly discovered that different individuals invest to different degrees in different aspects of the black pill worldview. One example of the way in which incel can be misconstrued or oversimplified is in this very recent Medium article. It repeats an intellectual maneuver that I have observed in several recent attempts to engage in cell, in that it focuses in on the sexlessness of individual men as somehow the root condition of the phenomenon. Definitions of incel which focus on sexlessness as a criteria, though, are really quite limited for two main reasons. Firstly, in many major incel sites of dialogue, only men are permitted to register and contribute. So already you can see it's not enough to be sexless, you, you must also be a man. Secondly, sexually active men are permitted to join incels.co, for example, so long as they subscribe to the Black Pill worldview. This is inscribed into the rules of the website and forum itself. Ergo, sexlessness, sexlessness is not, according to many incels, a sufficient criteria for really identifying the community. What is sufficient, at least to access their spaces and be recognized there, is an adherence to the Black Pill's explanation for why incels exist in the first place. Um, in the second half of this presentation then now, I want to kind of talk about a specific example of the ways in which the incel community invested in the Black Pill embrace and reject its neoliberal environment. Um, so neoliberalism is a neoliberal is, is a term that, that's kind of subject to incredible amount of debate and, and denial sometimes in political science. Um, there is a literature on the founding vision of the early neoliberals that goes you know, back at least to the Mont Pelerin society and the impact that this vision enacted has had on contemporary society and the subjectivities that it produces. Uh, typically these writers argue that building on Hayekian theory Neoliberalism from its very beginning elevated an abstract idea of the market to an epistemic position. In more simple terms, this frames the market and price function outside the comprehensibility of humans as a natural, inexorable condition of humankind. I refer to a neoliberal ethos in this way, prioritizing scientific, mathematic, or otherwise quantitative expertise and knowledge with a higher epistemological authority than theoretical presuppositions and or hypotheses. Many incels embrace this understanding of competition and the market to a hysterical degree. This is demonstrated in the polarity of interactions oriented around the quantitative rating of body parts and the gathering of market knowledge around, for example, the evolutionary biological and psychological hardwiring of women as it pertains to sexual behavior. The logic which underpins this obsession is the principle that the true value of the self is found in a sexual market outcome. If you're endlessly rejected on Tinder or on OkCupid, the true value of yourself in this worldview is zero. I claim that the incel community broadly adheres to the founding neoliberal position then that society is, was, and always will be organized along competitive grounds and market outcomes. This goes some way to explaining the incessant references to suicide, depression, and a desire for exit. Incels typically articulate a self-loathing which is explicitly justified by their failure in the sexual market, a loathing for the self only matched by its hatred of the feminist establishment supposedly responsible for locking them out. Crystallizing this hatred is a belief that this underclass of men, the detritus of human hypergamy and feminism, do not even have the right to speak this truth freely and have it heard in public spaces. And as an aside, I'd say that linking the kind of the incel plight to broader questions around freedom of speech. It's a very interesting development in, you know, in mainstream political discourse at the moment. 
Ultimately, though, in spite of the misandrous crusade by a feminist bloc to destroy all unattractive men, the market remains in the incel worldview a principle of organization and a site of truth more powerful than any theoretical presupposition that, for instance, foregrounds empathy and personality in the forming of romantic bonds. Incel then, in its fervent belief in the epistemic priority of competition and market as sites in which truth and knowledge are produced, inhabits the neoliberal way of looking at the world to a T. In this sense, incel is much a part of the fabric of its surrounding ideology as the pickup artists of O'Neill's study. However, where incel does authentically transgress from the neoliberal ethos, is in its explicit condemnation of the kind of self-improvement discourse that pickup artists, as well as any number of dating advice columns, popular media and so on, engage in. This is a hugely important distinction between the black pill worldview which Cell subscribes to and the red pill associated with other manosphere groups. According to the black pill, there is no hope of, in, to use the parlance, ascension from inceldom there are only transitory ways to cope, to distract the self from the eternal market verified truth of worthlessness. Whether there really is no hope outside of total physical transformation is a fraught and contested claim within the incel community. What is clear, however, is that the dating advice given to incels is treated with derision dressing better, hitting the gym, practicing your game and so on. It doesn't seem to matter who is giving this advice to incels either, whether it's a parent, a TV show, or the red pill snake oil shit of other manosphere groups, or masculinist groups for that matter. It's interpreted as functioning all the same way, a false offer of a false hope, which is too cowardly to admit the reality that unattractive men are hated by women and a feminist society and always will be. This rejection of future possibilities and transformation, the rejection of pop cultural visions of youthful exuberance and responsibility free fun, corporate and cultural demands on appearing normal which presume a heterosexual and sexually active relationship and crucially the rejection of the belief that our physical and emotional capitals can be always be managed like the extension of a LinkedIn account in order to succeed. This is a rejection of the ideal neoliberal citizen subject. It's a rejection of the entrepreneur of the self, to use the Foucauldian phrase. In this sense, at least, incel is entirely at odds with its ideological environment and additionally, most of the manosphere. The incel mantra of it's over summarizes the black pill diagnosis of being an incel. Lay down and rot in its preference for slow death over continued investment in a repetitive cycle of competitive failure is its endpoint. It's a bleak and destructive, but also in some regards transgressive vision. Thank you for that listening. <laughs> Daniel, oh, Henry, sorry, it's <laughs> thank you, Henry. That was really no problem. If I can exit your switch off. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> um, that was really, really uh, great, um, and certainly a lot, a lot also, a lot to talk about with regards to to that really interesting tension you identify between the kind of the the place of, of neoliberal neoliberal rationality in, in 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 cell ideology i think that it's really really fascinating uh, we will now move on to jacob jacob johansen um with well, again which i should read the uh bio there um so uh, 
Jacob is presenting uh, a talk entitled No Fab, Porn Addiction and the Unqueering of Male Sexuality. Um, he's a senior lecturer in communications at St. Mary's University London uh, with research interests that include social media, psychoanalysis and the media, sexuality. He's currently writing a book on online uh, misogyny. Has it been already? Jacob? Not yet. Oh, not yet. Oh, maybe uh, I thought. Maybe I, I thought I've seen it, but maybe not. Uh, he's currently writing a book on um, online misogyny, psychoanalysis in the manosphere. So YouTubers, incels. Oh God, MGTLW, which I am very unfamiliar with, and no fab, uh, which will be out with Routledge later this year. So over to you, Jacob. Thank you. I'm just going to share my. Green. Okay. Right. So, um, okay. So, um, thanks for, for, for the introduction. Um, as I was just mentioned, this um, talk that I'm going to give is um, based on um, my forthcoming book, which should hopefully be out with Route Mission early 2021, um, which is a kind of overall sort of study of uh, the manosphere and kind of related uh, aspects um, where I look at alt-right YouTube, YouTubers, incels, MGTOW, which is men going their own way, um, mass shooters uh, who, who kind of come, come out of the manosphere or kind of link to it, and also NoFab. I'm going to uh, focus on NoFab today. Um, those of you who don't exactly know what NoFab is. I haven't heard uh, about NoFab. Um, just a brief introduction. Basically, NoFab is a anti-pornography, um, anti-porn, and anti-masturbation community, um, which was also kind of originates um, originated on Reddit, or kind of kind of uh, was sort of founded on Reddit in 2011 by um, a web developer, and he then. Um, as it became so kind of successful, moved it to its own dedicated website. The original subreddit, NoFap, is still there. Um, but there is also now nofap.com, um, nofap um, which has its own forum, which is where I kind of uh, be um, taking some, some data from in, in, in this talk. Um, I should also say just a bit of a kind of content warning. Uh, some of the kind of quotes that I'll be, I'll be reading out are also may also be um, offensive to, to, to some. Um, NoFap, uh, even though it is, I would kind of count it as being part of the manosphere. Um, incels, for example, we just heard about, they specifically uh, mentioned NoFap quite a lot and MGTOW um, as well. Um, but NoFap in, in principle is also open to women. And there are also, um, there's a forum, for example, which is specifically um, aimed at women on nofap.com but the overall kind of vast majority of, of NoFap users are male and, and are also white, um, even though there are, there are no, there's no kind of definitive data on, on the demographics or on the kind of backgrounds of those men. Um, NoFap specifically, the NoFap users specifically frame uh, their kind of um, anti-masturbation, anti-porn kind of, kind of stance as an addiction. So, so, so they are addicted to uh, porn and addicted to masturbation um, and they also kind of frame this in, in a kind of pseudo-scientific way uh, which I'm not going to go into too much detail today. Um, of course this, this kind of community also relates to kind of wider socio-historical contexts like um, sort of uh, it's not the first kind of anti-masturbation um, kind of community. Um, there are kind of uh, lots of anti-masturbation discourses which have been around for, for hundreds of years and so on. Um, and this also relates to kind of anti or pro-porn debates, which, which of course kind of come out of feminism and other, other circles as well. And I'm not really kind of going into, so in this talk, I'm not kind of, I'm not really interested in kind of debating or kind of, kind of taking a position on kind of pro or anti-porn. Here's another screenshot uh, from the forum where you have kind of different uh, sections where, where users can post things. Okay, um, just checking my time. Okay, so um, NoFap, 
as I briefly said, is specifically kind of um, around, kind of, kind of focused on questions around um, heterosexual white masculinity that is also kind of in, in sort of psychoanalytic terms phallic. So it's about the kind of this idea of the phallus, kind of male symbolic power. I kind of can unpack this a lot more in my, in my book. That is, that is kind of central here. Um, and it also relates to neoliberalism, um, which we kind of just heard a little bit about kind of how incels are kind of situated in sort of neoliberal ideology. No fab users specifically um, uh, kind of frame their sort of addictions as um, neoliberal kind of kind of unpro un unproductivity or as kind of failures of embodying a neoliberal subjectivity because their porn addiction, their kind of masturbation addiction makes them unproductive. And it makes them unproductive specifically in terms of heterosexual relationships and also a more general kind of neoliberal entrepreneurial sort of success of the individual. They attribute that to their addiction. Um, no fab, and this kind of puts it um, closely kind of to the, to, to the manosphere and the old right as well. Um, there are often discourses that are specifically uh, racist, that are specifically also kind of fascist and heavily draw on alt-right terminology and discourses. Um, for example, also in, in, in this term of a cuck that, that um, has been kind of transformed into a sort of a different meaning by the alt-right and, and, uh, and, and so on online. Uh, and it is also rooted in um, anti-feminism and, and, and misogyny. And I'll, I'll kind of uh, come back to this last point a bit in, my, in the second half of my presentation. Um, I'll look at kind of um, two main sort of, sort of examples of, of NoFap, um, just to kind of uh, outline some of, some of those narratives a bit more. And the first, um, both have to do with kind of uh, specific types of, of porn, specific types of pornography. And the first um, sort of set of narratives is about um, gay porn and, and the kind of relationship those uh, male users have uh, uh, to um, gay porn and kind of questions of, around being gay and so on. So, so uh, there are many, many uh, threads in this forum where masturbation itself is kind of labeled or is kind of called gay and is kind of called unmanly for a heterosexual male. It's something they shouldn't need, should, wouldn't have to do normally because um, they would be in a kind of heterosexual relationship and be a kind of successful neoliberal male, but uh, their addiction kind of makes this impossible. Um, and also specifically kind of when they talk about their consumption of um, heterosexual porn, it, this is also, uh, framed in, in terms of kind of gay, uh, kind of the, the gay uh, signifier, because they see male performers, they see other men who are, who are naked, who are, who are uh, performing, uh, who are taking part in uh, sex acts and so on. And this is another gay uh, thing um, for, for those men. Um, and also, they also kind of specifically talk about gay porn in so far as they kind of detail a journey a kind of addiction journey from um, starting with hetero porn and moving on to kind of gay porn because they kind of their addiction needed to be kind of uh, fed with kind of stronger stuff as, as they put it and this is all kind of their their narratives their kind of terminology so so gay porn is kind of um, rendered as something that is that is so extreme that is so kind of invasive uh, for them that they kind of need to do something about it and they have found no fab uh, and are trying to kind of uh, uh, um, kick this addiction and kind of get rid of all of this. Um, just two examples here, someone said, and if a man showed up on screen, I'd almost always switch to something else and disgust. It always seemed obvious straight pornography was just a precursor to gay stuff and I wanted no part of it. Or another uh, says, and I remembered how grossed out I was when I saw my first explicit porn movie and the erect dicks I saw it's just that over time, I became desensitized dicks. And this, um, these, these kind of sets of narratives, I would argue, is, is a form, uh, constitute a form of policing of what we could call a kind of 
fluid sexuality or in maybe in kind of quotation marks a kind of queer uh, form of sexuality which needs to be brought back into a kind of heteronormative realm into kind of heteronormative forms of sexuality uh, that those that those men need to kind of um, they need to defend against those kind of kind of um, other other kind of forms of sexuality and porn um, uh, uh, and and so these kind of narratives constitute a kind of defense mechanism um, it, specifically in, in psychoanalytic terms against the productivity of the unconscious and, and against the kind of um, what we could call kind of queerness of desire itself uh, which which for for kind of psychoanalysis desire itself uh, or, or sexuality itself often knows no kind of sexual orientation um, and this is something that those men kind of kind of defend against the other kind of genre that i quickly want to talk about um kind of porn genre is uh, much more niche um and is um called sissy hypno porn which i had never come across before until i read uh, those narrows or those those discussions on nofap because there are many many users who talk about this particular type of porn which is essentially um essentially videos where female um, uh, voices kind of hypnotize men in, in, in quotation marks um, and they are turned into sissies uh, or they're turned into women in those videos uh, those viewers and often this kind of features elements of humiliation verbal abuse uh, and it's kind of infused with scenes of, of, of naked men gay sex and so on um, and this may have kind of some some origins in in, in BDSM uh, and, and other kind of forms of uh, sexual culture, but it's 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 kind of um, turned into a particular type of porn here. And um, some of those narratives where uh, those men talk about their consumption of this kind of porn, which they kind of frame as extreme, as the kind of the most kind of extreme form. Um, so one person says. For those who don't know, sissy hypnosis porn is a subgenre that leverages and amplifies viewers' innate feelings of shame and inadequacy for the purposes of causing harm. They're explicitly designed to make the viewer question their sexuality and gender, break down their self-esteem, and pull them further into shame and addiction. While many are of low quality, some are clearly the work of individuals with training in sound engineering, hypnotherapy, or both. I expect that some are made by certified clinical uh, hypnotherapists were exercising their own fetishes. They use images with subliminal text, multiple voice tracks, binaural beats, and other techniques to create an extremely powerful, addictive, and destructive experience. These videos are dangerous. So a very, very kind of paranoid, um, uh, persecutory kind of fantasy is, is sort of laid out here of who uh, is kind of behind um, this kind of effort uh, uh, in, in producing those videos to kind of weaken those, those men. Uh, and this is kind of, we find this um, a lot where someone else uh, here is, is kind of questioning, is kind of wondering who is behind this, who is paying for this. Um, and they say on the first superficial glance, I speculated it must be some Western mogul supporting the radical left, one of those sponsoring LG, LGTB, agenda deconstruction of gender roles. So it's, it's, uh, um, very kind of kind of we see kind of misogyny anti-feminism or right kind of discourses how they come in here uh, someone else says it's mainly lgbtq fundamentally something that aims to disconnect sex from gender they push this stuff and make men into females it means their ideology is correct and they won a man will never be a woman nor will a woman be a man and then it's kind of linked here to third wave feminism uh, uh, female empowerment and and, and so on So just to um, conclude, because I think I'm sort of uh, running out of time soon, um, these kind of narratives I would kind of, in, in sort of quotation marks, call the, the sort of unqueering of, of, of desire. So the, the kind of very sort of conscious attempt by those men at kind of specifically limiting uh, the kind of productivity of the unconscious, the kind of productivity of desire, the kind of power of desire, and of course, we don't know if those particular kind of this kind of porn consumption of those particular videos, if that kind of 
um, is something that that those men kind of were you know were always kind of um, uh, sort of attracted to or kind of kind of curious about or whether this was they learned about this kind of through their kind of porn consumption we don't know what what came first it's kind of a chicken or an egg question um, but uh, those those narratives show a fear of of the men's un unconscious um, and and a kind of uh, uh, an, an effort to police kind of kind of sexuality to bring kind of their own subjectivity and kind of se uh, sexuality back into very very strict heteronormative um, uh, kind of kind of into heteronormative realm um, and any sort of non heteronormative sexuality or form of sexuality or desire it, they are defended against here um, and specifically in the in the in the last kind of example the sissy hypno porn example um, it's coupled with uh, anti-feminism and and kind of misogyny where uh, an other is kind of constructed, blame is kind of shifted onto um, women or kind of LGBTQ uh, individuals who, who sort of are behind this. Uh, uh, and this uh, kind of, this kind of symbolic sort of movement from kind of an addiction discourse, which is about kind of uh, weak men and their kind of kind of victims to blaming somebody, um, gives those men a kind of sense of agency, uh, a kind of phantasmatic agency because it's ultimately just uh, occurring online and they're just posting about it, who is kind of responsible, allegedly kind of responsible for this through very kind of paranoid um, fantasies, but it nonetheless uh, gives them a sort of agency because they can kind of write about it online. Thank you. Um, Jacob, that was certainly um, interesting parallels but, uh, among uh, all the, the three talks. Um, question on uh, Thomas uh, Strong is, is really wanting to know who makes these videos, the CC porn uh, hypno videos which sounds i mean something you know i will certainly be searching for them because i'm really really keen to to you know to 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 have a sense i have not encountered that particular no uh, hypno porn but do you have any sorry i do you have any sense oh. of who no. makes them no um no i don't um no i have i have no idea i mean this is also i didn't look into that um maybe i should i don't th i mean i certainly don't think there is this kind of you know there is not a conspiracy uh behind it um where <laughs> men uh, are, are sort of um, should be weakened where kind of feminists create those videos or whatever so so i don't think there is a particular um particular kind of kind of force behind it but we, I mean we could also see that as as just you know maybe a kind of fetish or kind of kind of uh, sexual interest that people have and for that reason they are created um, but it's an interesting question but I don't know if we will know the answer to that I mean I think before uh, so uh, if anyone has questions for Jacob Henry or Daniel uh, Daniel and Henry can also, if you want, turn your videos on. Um, yeah. Questions or mention that you have a question, I'll hand over the microphones to you. But I think what is, maybe I'll start with, with this interesting, something I found really interesting, and again, this kind of manosphere environments not really being something that I, I have, um, you know, the experience of or much knowledge about uh, of uh, what I found interesting is this tension in this question of the neoliberalism this idea of, of this uh, and not to bring in all you know kind of not to get all, all, all delusion with all of this but but this idea that you have on the one hand this kind of um, 
as, as he, he and Gotari wrote kind of schizophrenic force and this function, this paranoid function, both operating uh, together in the sense that on the one hand, it looks like neoliberalism is, it cre allows for, for all these justification of, of subject positions and of, of desire, uh, whilst on the other hand, there's this paranoid function that keeps on, on um, trying to rein it in and keep it in check and, and kind of contain these, these um, subjectivities, which I, I found that was quite interesting across all your three presentations, this kind of these users need to to really uh, protect and 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 infrastructures around their subject positions in order to some to somehow survive or protect themselves. And I wonder if you kind of um, would like to speak uh, uh, on that uh, of any of you three. Because I thought that was really something that ran through the the three the three papers. So you mean that this is both kind of enabled through neoliberalism, and then they 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 sort of um, uh, sort of sort of rebel against it in a way. Is that yes, yeah, so in a sense, it is the same the same logics that allow creates the conditions of possibility for these experiences positions to develop are also the, the threatening to them. So you are kind of caught a kind of a, a love-hate relationship between the thing that brought you into being hmm. that is also seen as the, the in some way, like neoliberal, um, yeah, I think I think I mean with with incels and 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 um, I'd be interested to you know what what Henry thinks of that. I think with incels, it's absolutely the case where uh, you um, have a kind of uh, sort of revolt or kind of rebellion against against neoliberalism. But I think ultimately, um, uh, what incels want, uh, even though they don't really kind of admit it. Is that they want to become neoliberal subjects too? They 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 have uh, they 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 um, have kind of failed uh, in neoliberal terms, but they want to become kind of quintessential new neoliberal subjects too. And this is also the case with with NoFap, where where um, um, they aspire to 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 kind of fulfill to kind of embody this neoliberal ideology. Yeah, I, I, should I jump in there and I, I, I'd add to, to, I'd agree and add to what Jacob's saying. I think that what's interesting about incel is that I think perhaps those contradictions or that paradox in, in the sense that they do kind of um, invest heavily in, in, in some neoliberal ideas and, and, and their complaint is that they can't compete. It's not that they mm. disagree that there is competition, right? And, and competition on, on, the, on the level of the self, you know? Um, and, and that's why I think incel is, it, it's important to remember incel understands itself, broadly speaking, as an emancipatory movement. It mm. uses the language of emancipation in that way. Mm. And mm. this highlights, I think, really that what, what is very, volatile about incel is that it, if taken to its its kind of its logical ends what you see is you see it is a kind of a negating force <laughs> you meet me there Jack. oh sorry me shut up. <laughs> so, um, um, but yeah so 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 they um they use this language of emancipation while, while at the same time kind of um, not seeking any real change. What they want is the terms of the market. It's a market adjustment is what they want, you know? 
did you what did you did you did you find uh daniel did you find any do you, do you want to 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 speak to that at all or or shall we well we can maybe move on but i do think the 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 communities that identify as manosphere communities like the ones that are we, um henry and jacob have, have talked quite a bit about um are really quite like self-aware in some sense like they are doing a kind of intellectual labor um you know they have this language like we're emancipatory you know i mean they have a framing a framework and an ideology that they're kind of following whereas i think a lot of these other communities that i was i'm more interested in the more casual ones are are in a sense really naive like they're not intellectually engage with why are they holding, why do men hold beers and women hold Cosmo in a way that maybe incels are intellectually engaged with why am I an incel, right? And, and there are, I think, intellectual failures there and intellectual breakdowns, um, like, uh, you know, it's, but it's like a kind of, like a awareness of like a neoliberal heuristic in the first place. Um, and so I think that like the, the larger communities are definitely like um, part of a neoliberal world and universe, but they're maybe not quite as, they're just maybe a little more naive to that. Whereas the, the, the ones that are more radicalized are a little bit more of those like people trying to like craft and compete in that marketplace themselves, um, which is just, I, it's, it's kind of the only thing I can think of in terms of how do they relate to this kind of political mode, you know? And can, I, can I say something? Go on, and then we move on to the, the there's quite the if, questions, but go on. Very quickly, yeah, because I think also, I think what also matters here, if we talk about kind of neoliberalism and kind of neoliberal democracy, um, and then kind of what I think comes in here as well is fascism. So, um, and, and, and the alt-right and so on. So I think, I think um, that's why there is this overlap between um, the alt-right um, manosphere and so on, because many, of those men, they actually they dream they dream of of, of fascism. They desire um, uh, kind of a, a neoliberalism being turned into into fascism, uh, and then they can have their kind of you know their kind of society or their kind of their kind of insultum and so on. Reminds me a great panel coming up on uh, myth and oh god fascist masculinities on and and the kind of myth. Uh, uh, and mythical origins um, with some with three great speakers uh, which again I can't remember the date but it will it is on the program question uh, John Mercer I will find you and unmute you uh, who has a question for Jacob yeah, it, it's a question for Jacob, but I guess it's a question that could be a, a, a addressed to any of the speakers, really. Um, for the record, Jacob, I'm very much pro-FAP rather than no-FAP. <laughs> um, but what I was really thinking whilst listening to all of the presentations is the extent to which self-pity is really embedded in the discourses of the manosphere. And that started me thinking about... Um, how theories of narcissism, and especially what I think is called covert narcissism, kind of operates. And I'm kind of wondering, given your background in um, psychoanalytic theory, the extent to which those kinds of models of thinking about um, personalities are useful frames for thinking about what's going on. Specifically, in terms of narcissism, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, that that that's that's a good that's a good question. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is a huge degree of self pity. I think particularly with incels and and also uh, no fap, um, and and but I think. Um, if if we kind of if, if we think about narcissism, all of these communities are they are, they are highly narcissistic, uh, I think, and um, they kind of um, I mean from a kind of psychoanalytic point of view, narcissism in itself is actually very valuable. Yeah, it, it kind of a healthy form of narcissism means that I kind of value myself and have a kind of 
kind of self kind of confidence in myself which is what these uh, men don't have yeah. uh, at least some of them and then they have a kind of strange understanding of the self um, and they maybe kind of develop the sense of narcissism which is really infused with we come back to neoliberalism with this kind of um, uh, in very very highly individualized uh, kind of form of uh, sort of understanding of themselves but then at the same time I think what's interesting about those communities is that they they form I mean they form around those kind of uh, those kind of identities that they construct yeah. so so I know that there are some uh, some scholars who kind of say we could also see those as kind of male spaces where men you know where men can kind of kind of uh, uh, bond even though they bond around destruction uh, yeah. uh, and, and kind of destructive fantasies um, but maybe that kind of is, a, is, is more of a collective uh, kind of experience I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to that argument because I think it's well it's a community but then it's a it's it, it's a I mean particularly incels is a community of destruction so what's the point um, but there is a kind of there is a kind of kind of uh, uh, interplay maybe between sort of highly individualized forms of subjectivity and the more kind of collective experience. Thank you, Jacob. Question, please. Uh, also, if any of the, of the other two speakers also want to interject, just, just speak freely because you shall forever be unmuted. Um, there is a question from uh, Benjamin Hudson for Henry. One second, I will unmute you. Uh, okay, Benjamin, go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say uh, some really interesting talks across the board there. Um, for Henry, like evidently, uh, I imagine throughout your thesis, you like delve quite deeply into the world of the incel uh, and their different online communities. Um, after kind of like studying it for such a long time and in such detail, like what kind of effect has it had on you personally to an extent? I imagine a lot of the language and the content uh, is very intense and grim and to be kind of subverting yourself into that kind of so frequently. Uh, I wondered if it taken kind of much of a, of a toll on you personally and has your experience kind of given you any insight into uh, how easy it might be for young men to kind of fall into these communities? Um, thanks for your question. Um, Okay, so that's, that's really interesting. So on a, on a personal level, um, I was um, spending kind of several hours a day on incels.co, on, on a variety of subreddits, on listening to Incest, which is kind of a recent series of podcasts interviewing people who are more or less quite sympathetic. Um, and, and in fact, actually, one of the most interesting parts of this whole thing has been seeing um, some commentators um, approach the topic of incel in a way that perhaps is intending to demystify and make human what is ordinarily pathologized, which I think is a laudable aim. I think sometimes that's done in a way that kind of makes invisible the quite serious uh, implications of not so much the necessarily the individuals who are posting these comments but the cumulative effect of having spaces dedicated to a very you know in some ways quite actually a, a structural analysis of how um, feminism has taken over and, and it's very much part of a much broader anti-gender ideology movement that's global you know and it's some actually what Jacob was saying about where fascism comes in to me I always think of that um sexual fantasy the uh, the klaus Dowlight text looking at the the, the storm troop uh, the free corps after world war one I, I i'm very uh nervous trepidatious about the tying of sexual identity to a political identity in that way that happening more and more broadly speaking um at, at first go, going into the immersion period I was quite <laughs> masculine in the sense about thinking it wouldn't have an effect. It's quite easy to kind of, you know, treat it as, you know, just kind of exotic weirdness, you know, the, the you know, pathologizing what's being said. It was, after a while, it did make me really question my own relationship, my own sexuality in, in, in quite um, unpleasant ways. Uh, I really, I, I didn't enjoy it. I had to take 
<laughs> a bit of time off afterwards. <laughs> really didn't like it. In, it. The second part of your question, though, about how particularly young men can become embroiled in this is really pertinent, I think. And that's where anti-radicalization efforts, I think, do have a real important place in this, in, in trying to bring, you know, bring some sort of attention to this issue. If I was, you know, 14, 15, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I was just on the cusp, I just missed out, you know, on like 4chan and all this stuff. And, and if I had cussedincels.co, I'd see it, or if I'd gone on the incel wiki, which, which has all this, you know, the scientific black pill proving supposedly with reference appeals to masculine objective scientific data to prove how horrible all women are and how feminist society is out to kill me. Uh, I, 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 that's, that's the root of sympathy. We should have sympathy with that process. People, people who are not bad, not evil people can get wrapped up in this stuff, definitely. And, but it, what, what's really important to me, and then I'll shut up, is that we, we maintain that route, that, you know, a core, a core approach of sympathy, but we don't minimize the misogyny, we don't minimize the significance of the, of the violence that's in that worldview. That, that's what I'd say. <laughs> so it's a bit of a vague response. All right, cheers. Um, I will, I know there is another question for, from Chris Griffin for Henry. To be going to into now uh, Haitian, Haitian liberalism. Uh, you've asked for it. You shall have it. Uh, but be just to have you just continue. Uh, yeah, I'll move to a, another question that there is to Jacob, and we'll then come to, come back to you, Henry, on the on the on Haitian neoliberalism, but. On, uh, we're going to be speaking on our next session today. Um, and Jordan uh, Osman have a question which kind of, I think, build on one another, Jacob, on about the, the psychoanalytical frame you, you're mm. using, particularly with regards to Freud's kind of also as Don puts it, economic slash balance sheet conception of the libido. Uh, and Jordan Osserman, having made the ground, heard here first that Freud was the, first, the, the, the OG new NoFap, uh, followed by Emily Bratton at NoFap Freud being Freud's Twitter handler. Over to you, Jacob. I, th I think someone should create that that account and do lots of uh, Freud nofab memes. Um, so please, please do. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I also kind of say in in this chapter um, on nofab, those um, nofab users they are Freudian, yeah, in a way they're they're Freudian how how they kind of understand their body and and so on. And of course, um, that is quite. Um, a, bit of a kind of problematic understanding that Freud had, as we know, uh, and also in relation to other things about sexuality. In terms of my kind of framework, very, very briefly, I also come, I mean, I come from kind of Freud, um, nonetheless, but I also draw on um, Tevelite, who was just mentioned, Klaus Tevelite and his kind of male fantasies, two volume mega you know, study, thousand pages uh, book, books, two books, and and um, also uh, Reich, Wilhelm Reich, because Tevelite kind of draws heavily on, on Reich as well. So I kind of try to synthesize that a little bit in my framework when it, when it comes to kind of thinking about those fantasies um, and particularly kind of how, how it also affect uh, kind of figures in those narratives. Thank you. So, uh, do you, Henry, do you want to then tackle the the the, the Haitian neoliberalism question, which I guess I mean I don't know if Chris wants to 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 ask it, or if I can just read it. Uh, but the question, as it is written on the chat, is whether it is a rejection of neoliberalism. Um, 
if that inability to meet the systemic ideals continues as a source of mortal decline, uh, and whether the sub eight could be seen as a site for radical recalibration of the politics of desire, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I suppose I'm, I'm interested in, in what is meant by source of mortal decline in this context. Um, so, so maybe I'll uh, look and plug and mute Chris to see if Chris wants to. Yeah. No. Hello. Hi. Sorry about that. Um, my, I'm got, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. It was a very lengthy question, wasn't it? I was trying to get something out. Um, yeah. No, I'm that my own work focuses on neoliberalism and I have more of a peripheral interest in, in so far. So I thought interesting to talk about. But yeah, um, mortal decline was somewhat tongue in cheek in, in as much as um, I know it mentioned the idea that the sub eight is this kind of, I mean, I could be completely misunderstanding. So please do correct me. Um, but the idea of this sub eight is this figure of like, okay, look, there's no improvement for you. You're not going to fit into the market me mechanism of the enterprise, uh, enterprising self-improving subject. So, um, you know, this is it for you. You kind of need to just make measures to mediate your existence enough to continue. And whether, and that made me think about, uh, well, Albert Camus and kind of the Sisyphean hero, or the idea that someone is constantly pushing the rock up the hill and it falls down, but they just keep going. And, and is it a possible bit, this, this sub eight as, if it's this figure that's kind of external to the politics of desire that exists in neoliberalism, can that be a point of recalibrating? Or is it a point of, no, this figure, you know, there is no hard and fast rule, but you know, this figure isn't someone who's likely to be able to be uh, a figure of change or something that can be changed. They're, they're somebody who's still haunted by the fact that in the eyes of this system, they are a figure of decline or someone that just can't get up this ladder. Um, I don't know if that clarifies what I'm kind of interested in there, but, but that was what I was moving towards. No, that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and, um, you know, I, what I think is it's, it's useful to remind ourselves that, of course, when we talk about the incel worldview, we're actually talking about the world as it's seen through certain eyes, right? It's not, it, you know, to, to, the in, to the incel, this is reality. It's not a worldview. And so um, the next step from that is, well, within how um, incels understand their environment, I think they would very much want the sub eight uh, to be, you know, the, you know, uh, the, some sort of symbolic representation of the sub eight to become a, a, a site for radical recalibration of the politics of desire, as you put it. I think that that would be um, something that would interest them. Whether or not I think it will be, I don't know. We've already had, you know, the, the you know, nerd culture and, and and so these things have a kind of a way of recycling i think and and um you know understandings of sexual desirability and the uh the way in which that influences social organization be be because of course you've got to remember with incels they you know there's this whole theory of lookism that various incels subscribe to to different extents the idea that that it's not just um access to sexual partners that's dictated by how you look. It's your job prospects. It's even your personality. I've seen the current Twitter feed of incels.co banging on about that today. You know, like even your personality, whether or not you're nice or interesting or friendly or whatever, that's according to them all born out of, you know, a kind of quantifiable metric of your attractiveness, right? So, you know, in answer, I know I'm not really answering your question other than to say that, that within the incel community, I'd say we'd love that to be the case. Outside of that, I'm not sure. I kind of hope not, you know? I'm, I'm really not convinced that I think we're accepting too much ground if we push for, you know, I'm all, you, you know heightened beauty standards and self-management um, in the neoliberal era has very ambiguous effects for men and women, right? So making this purely a case of kind of like a masculine sexuality politics, I think would be quite dangerous potentially, but I think it might be happening in certain places. I hope that helps. <laughs> Maybe one last question, and that comes from Jack who is also speaking at the fascist parent 
on the eighth, I believe. Uh, Jack uh, is this is primarily, but possibly also for to everyone. Uh, Jack, maybe you can read it, but is there? I guess there is a con. There is a kind of a question. I guess is there is a is there a link between the apocalypse? fetishism of online intel communities and the broader ripe accelera accelerationist thought intensify and enhance neoliberal economics. Yeah, I think there's probably maybe a question for everyone. Yeah, probably. I mean, I think if when incels discover uh, neo-reactionism, we are all screwed. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I don't think they've made that link yet. Um, but no, of course there is, I mean, to, to joke, jokes aside, there is, uh, there is a link there. Um, um, and, and this whole idea of kind of in, insultum, this kind of idea of ascending that, that insults have, um, I think um, for, for, for that, some kind of sort of a, a apocalypse needs to happen first and then society will be kind of re structured and, and, and so on. And that's of course also something that those, you know, someone like Elliot Roger and, and Breivik and other kind of misogynist shooters think, think about what they want to achieve uh, as well. So, so I think there is, there is a, a link there, definitely. I, I, I would like, whoever Jack Lewis is, that's a fantastic question. And I think, I mean, it's something that, that's preoccupied me now for a while. Um, I love Sandifer's work in this in this area. Um, Malberg's um, uh, the way he he has kind of gone through red pill into you know now he's he's doing his white pills and whatever it's called American Mind or Jacobite or something. Um, I, I think you can draw some quite interesting parallels between uh, Nick Land's hyper racism ideas and some of the stuff that's going on in. In, in incel, I think it's complete um, misnomer to, to to think about incel as just teenage boys moaning about not being able to have sex. There is clearly a lot more going on, and there are some there are some some people who are adjacent to the likes of Nick Land, Mobber, whoever they are, um, that are well aware. They are well aware of that, and and it's not as innocent almost that's not a word that you hear used with incel very often but it's not as innocent as as men sad even that they don't get validated in a neoliberal society there is definitely a crossover there we probably don't have time to discuss it all now but i think it's a great question and it's something people need to consider more now maybe also again, a great question like like um um who was this tibor uh Thomas also mentioned maybe also a great question to to continue a topic to continue um, exploring at the um, the fastest paranoid masculinities panel on on the eighth. Um, I would I guess we'll draw to 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 a close. Neo incels. Jack says arrives from the future. New incel arrives from the future. Uh, uh, draw to a close. I will I will. You to to before we, we, we thank our three speakers uh, panel in about an hour and a half. Uh, well, it was supposed to be a panel. Now it's it's a, a one person talk, so it's a kind of a shorter keynote if you if you want uh, with with uh, Don uh, Woolley with the, also an incredible an incredible sound. It is the quantified self and fat male bodies. And tomorrow we start at 1 p.m. Uh, tomorrow 1 p.m. London time for masculinities and homosocialities, and then 3 p.m. London time masculinities in historical perspectives. Uh, Daniel is on Instagram at DS Chapman. If anyone wants to to talk, I think he's handle on the slideshow jacob is also on twitter uh thank you all thank you three for 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 uh, really three great papers and again if you're interested in this topic the manosphere two two should happen 
um, the 7th of September, 11 a.m. London time. Thank you. And Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.